So Dr. Stephen Martin's career has taken several twists and turns, but there's a common theme, uh, intellectual rigor, a steadfast commitment to patients, primary care and health justice, and finally a passion for educating the next generation of physicians. Steve started his professional career as a middle, middle school and high school teacher and found his way to medicine, graduating from Harvard Medical School in 2002. He trained in family medicine, as he said, at Boston University in the South Boston Community Health Center. And while at BMC, he was a member of the CIR and a veteran CIR negotiating team member, which maybe he doesn't remember so much, but most of us who sat on that. <laughs> most of us who sat on it certainly remember those negotiating uh, committees. Um, so after residency, he completed his National Health Services Corps commitment in two equally challenging sites. First, he established a community health center satellite in the North Quabbin region of Massachusetts and served as its sole full spectrum primary care physician. Uh, then he served as a medical officer at the Federal Prison Medical Center in Devons, Massachusetts caring for patients with end-stage renal, liver, and cardiac disease, complex rooms, wounds, trauma, and illness. And since 2009, he's been the principal investigator of a group of examining the health effects of the Federal Bureau of Prisons tobacco ban. Um, currently, he's an assistant professor of family medicine and community health at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. He serves as a residency faculty at the Rural Berry uh, Family Health Center where his primary care practice is located. And at the center, he also co-directs the Rural Health Scholars Program for medical and graduate nursing students. In 2013, he was awarded Preceptor of the Year by the Massachusetts Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, he's a member of the National Physici Physicians Alliance Policy Committee, as well as the Integrating Oral Health and Primary Care Working Group based at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. So please welcome me in joining, uh, welcome Dr. Martin. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it's a gift to be with you all here today, and I'm glad for such a, uh, a nice and uh, close environment. Um, I'm, I'm, channel I'm channeling Ruth right now so I can do a good job. Uh, so, um, <laughs> and I, I do want to especially thank you so much for the introduction and to Dr. Paley and, and Absentia for her terrific keynote. and especially to Sandy, um, who has been uh, just a tremendous friend and advocate. Um, uh, anyway, all of our kids know Sandy. Sandy introduced our children to cream cheese sandwiches, <laughs> which was Ben's basically his form of sustenance for at least, I think, a year and a half. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, I won't be talking any more about that. Okay. okay. <laughs> We're not recording this, are we? Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, in the Bureau of Prisons, they talk about the, the BOP family, and, um, and it's really very meaningful, actually. Uh, you know, the folks who go to work there every day uh, have to feel as those fo other colleagues have their back and have their support, and we don't carry any weapons in the prison. So, if someone gets in trouble, it's just a bunch of people running after you to help out. Um, and two of my best friends there are now taking care of the marathon bomber suspect. And um, they don't get any extra pay for doing that. They don't, uh, people didn't have to ask who would do a good job. Um, there are a tremendous number of clinicians and caretakers in the prison setting who would step up and do that work uh, professionally and um, with heart and also with, um, uh, with a sense of humility and a sense of composure. And I think that those are some of the, the, the characteristics, I think, that we really valued doing our work here in, in the area and that we still value. And I want to pay press harder on them because I think, as you'll come to see, I, I really think, like, I think we all think that these are the values that are actually going to carry American health forward. Um, American health going forward will not be uh, solved by the da Vinci robot. In fact, it'll be undone by da Vinci robots and has been undone. Um, and it, it's incumbent on us to hold fast to the things that will help people and to resist and uh, push back at our institutions against those things that are useless for people and cost them lots of money. Because the opportunity costs of those elements is 
uh, has become has been too great for too long. So that's my talk, and so I'm really glad you came. Uh, it's been wonderful having uh, you here, and uh, uh, let's see if I can actually uh, make this happen. So um, it's going to be very brief. It's a very dark talk. It's, about, it's a talk. It's a talk about night, really, and uh, and in this nighttime. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. So all right, daytime. So this is. Um, uh, I think this is the architecture that we're headed for. And I, I don't say this lightly. Um, this is a very difficult building to build, a very difficult building to design, and is said to have among the best acoustics of any uh, concert hall in the world. Um, and it isn't, although it looks stochastic and chaotic and almost unsettling, that's what people's lives are like. That's what people's lives are like. And often in academic medicine, as you know, and throughout our medical system, we try to instead give an ICD-9 code to people, and then that's who they are, really, I think, right? They're just they're a 304.00, and we're sort of done with that now. But this building, this kind of architecture, I think more ably represents what we can offer people. And is you'll see that it was actually a person far wiser than me that came up with this idea. But that's to incite you, incite you to stay for, for the rest of the talk. That'll be revealed at the end. So uh, I, I'm very grateful to be here, very grateful to, to have this time. Be glad to share the slides with anyone afterwards. And um, as Ruth knows, they were very recently conceived, these slides. So I apologize for any errors uh, that you may see. So I have no conflict of interest. OK. Um, here we are, right? This, uh, this, this is in the Wayback Machine, and um, these buildings are still extant, right? And uh, this should give us a sense of history. I think we, it's important that we root ourselves in why this building was built, why Cambridge Hospital was built, why Bellevue was built, why Los Angeles County was built, Cook County was built. Why were these places built? They were built to care for people who had little else. They were not built to be a money-making machine or increase revenue, or introduce a technology that wasn't helpful. They were, they were there to help people in the community who needed help. Um, this is the way that I often think of Boston City <laughs> sometimes, right? This is uh, my view at 5 in the morning when uh, we'd be going to the OB floor, and my co-resident, Liz Frutiger, and I would be looking at the Suffolk County Jail, and we'd be like, would I rather go to the OB floor? And do I, or do I wish I were now incarcerated <laughs> instead, because there it'd be like a regimented program. No one would hurt me a lot. I mean, they'd hurt me, in, but it wouldn't be out of the blue. I would sort of know what I was doing, maybe. Uh, so that was my sort of sense of the darkness, the dark days that would come. But we did have parking, which was yes. very cool. Uh, and here are some going to the Wayback Machine, right, with the Cambridge Health Alliance and the hospital. And I just want to tie us back again, put us back in that place. What did that feel like? What were the what were the sense that we have there? And boy, I mean, Dan, I don't know, I've tried to get folks in this picture, but look at this. Look at the high five happening there, <laughs> right? Isn't that, cr I mean, that was just right. Like, people were getting it. Like, there was stuff happening. This is what we appreciated. This is, look at the CRT, man, right? <laughs> I mean, this is good time. I mean, this is stuff that mattered. What else do we see? That picture is still there. <laughs> I, think, I think these papers are still there, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, right? There's a lot of stuff here that didn't really make a lot of sense. And Sunrise Clinical Manager was doing all the work, and you were sort of just like, I was ordering echoes on the wrong people. And you know, safety and quality hadn't really come to it for yet, but I was just trying really hard. And uh, so this is uh, my partner, Liz Frutiger, and I uh, sort of trying to work in the phones here, right? And uh, this is, look at this. What's that? No, 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 phlebotomy doing cultures, right? Look at that. Like, is this the ubiquitous, like, announcement? Like, this is, we were like, oh, my God, hang that high, hang it proud that phlebotomy is going to do blood cultures now. Because I feel like, damn, like, I feel like my IV skills are really quite good. Oh I can do feats. Oh I can do whatever. Yeah. I remember one guy on the pediatric floor with a baby. He's like, that, temp that thing is looking so, it's right there. It is right there. <laughs> I'm like, man, that's over the top. But, you know, we were getting the work done. And our bow tie was more fresh back then. And this is Liz's prescription for me 
testosterone, a thousand, 10,000 grams to survive OB rotation every day, right? And that's what you needed. You needed some, you needed some mojo to do this, and we can't pretend otherwise, right? This wasn't a job where you went in, or it still isn't, where you're going in and you're getting your bonbons and your pedicure kind of thing. And it shouldn't be. It just shouldn't be. And th I think that's some, a signal that we want to extend. How many people have the good fortune to actually find that license plate? Look at that. Selfie. Selfie. <laughs> I mean, what are the odds that I would have found that car? So I followed in Ruth's footsteps to South Boston Community Health Center. I actually was lucky enough to take over her patient panel and here for the next three years, where's Dr. Poti? She was so good, you're so bad. Why isn't she here? Why can't I see her? Why are you hiding her from me? So that was my experience in South Boston. Um, but I love this car, I mean the caddy, I mean you just gotta love that, that is classic, right? And here, how about that, huh? Isn't that nice? See, I found that last night, honey. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Okay. Is this the South Boston Drapes? I think this is the uh, South. I can't tell. Yeah. Okay. We still have the stuff. I think it got lost. I still have mine. Okay. I don't want to talk about what's growing on that thing because Cammy's going to culture that thing for me. It's going to be like, oh, this, uh, this clone was, you know, from 2000. <laughs> right. Okay. So let me extend the picture a little bit here to other entities like ours, right? Pardon? Do people know this place? Yeah, isn't this, I mean, this is our world, right? Yeah. I mean, we have Venn diagrams that intersect in this room in, in degrees of separation that are so tight that we often miss. And I, I just want to call attention to the National Physicians Alliance again because I didn't even know that group until last year. And now I'm like, they are a rock star. <laughs> like, I get goosebumps going to talk with them. So, like, there are other entities out there that are very powerful, very thoughtful, powerful in the way we think about powerful, right? Not powerful in that other way. We'll talk about that later. Okay, but people are doing good work all over, right? In community health centers, safety net hospitals, uh, on the floor, in the clinic, in the home, in the IHS, in Shiprock. I mean, people are doing the work in resource-constrained environments where social determinants of health are absolutely crucial, just as they are for, guess what? Everybody else. And where uh, we have to be cognizant of uh, why we're there. We're there often because of reasons of intrinsic motivation. I mean, you cannot do this work, I think, in the long term, and I'm speaking from experience in times when I've been very down doing, doing the work. If you don't have it inside to do this work, there's not a paycheck that's gonna get you through this, right? And, and again, I think that articulating that, I, one of, Ruth knows the thing that gets my fire in the belly in a separate talk, is this alternative quality contract uh, pay for performance crap that's gone like wildfire through Massachusetts and where UMass was the last academic health center to sign on. And I was like, people, what happened in Boston? What were you guys doing when this thing came down? Because this thing is a nightmare in terms of providing care that people don't need and twisting our, uh, and distracting us from actual care and attention they do. So folks in corrections are by and large, again, I'm speaking not of a platonic ideal, but in the main, right, we know tough things can happen. We know California was in receivership for very bad care for people, but a very underfunded correction system. So I'm talking about in the main, when you feel it, when you know there's a harmony between what you feel people, people need and what you're able to do, that's what happens. This is my boss uh, from the Federal Bureau of Prisons, the clinical director there, Sandra Howard. And I learned so much from her. I mean, she had an equanimity She's been sued, I think, more than any doctor <laughs> I know, right? Because every prisoner at a federal prison has their own lawyer. And they are suing you. You are the first person to get sued. We have our own legal team on site. So when you're thinking about why you're providing care, the, so the equanimity you have to have to provide care knowing that you're going to be named a lawsuit, and it's uncomfortable, and you know you'll probably be fine, but it is not good times. And yet what she taught me and my other colleagues there, this sense of what what that kind of elemental work is like is powerful. And I think, again, this is a family for us. I think corrections, Indian Health Service, community health centers uh, are all a family of safety nets that, that we can tie into. Um, when I was there, I learned a great deal more about people in the public health service. And those folks are doing the work. I mean, they're doing the work. Uh, whether you're after Hurricane Sandy or Katrina, 
whether you're in a correction site, these are folks passing out um, meals to people in a nursing home, right? These folks didn't say, well, you know what, I wasn't trained to do that. Or, you know what, that's, uh, my qualifications are a little above that. They're like, oh, people need food. I'm going to help people get food. Um, so I think, again, these models are, ones, are important ones for us to channel and take hold of. And I'm including the military in this, the VA, the military. These folks don't get like brass plated, gold plated parking spaces and Cadillacs to go around with. Like they are, they are resource constrained in ways that we are as well. And yet they have a sense of mission and a sense of camaraderie and a sense of uh, healing uh, that's incredibly powerful. And I think was shown in the Escape Fire documentary if you might have had a chance to see that. So uh, this happens in the VA. We all had the chance to either work in the Death Star uh, I had a chance to, this, is that the name of it, Ruth, right? Uh, is that what we call the JPB? JP when it closed down, yeah. yeah. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, 1,200 beds. I mean, that place is massive. And I was at West Rocks, and I get, like, these places are very powerful, okay? And, and the kind of care they provide is remarkable. Um, and again, I think that's, that's got to get in our DNA. This is just some photographs, international photographs. This is from Ireland. Like, this is no different anywhere else. Like, people are in the game. This is from Los Angeles. Just, they're, just the pictures of people connecting. Um, so to get back to our roots, this is actually, this is a scanned, this is scanned from the actually the original. I got to be, this is actually secondary. So this is from the Countway. But someone had ripped out the page, <laughs> or it had been used so many times that it had fallen out. That's probably what happened. So this is like a, <laughs> a scan of the original, but this is, a, this is getting close to the action, right? So this is, this is an unbelievable article. This is, a pre, this is an, an enduring article. I read it again last week. It's as inspiring now as it must have been in 1927, and Peabody was just a year or two away from dying. Um, I, I can't tell, I mean, this article gets, is very grounded. This article is not about Da Vinci robots. You know, Peabody is not like, God, I wish I had a Da Vinci robot. We could take care of so many more people at Boston City. Uh, do, what Peabody was saying was what we know to be true. The physician who attempts to take care of a patient while neglecting the emotional life, the social determinants, that person's life is as unscientific as the investigator who neglects to control all the conditions. The good physician knows his patients through and through, and his knowledge is bought dearly. <coughs> Time, sympathy, and understanding must be lavishly dispensed. Lavish, when was the last time you heard the words lavishly dispensed in one of our institutions? I think they've been lavishly dispensed on some other crap, but not on this. Not on this. On my screensaver at UMass, most recently we had one third of Americans are losing sleep over their finances and the economy. The next screenshot is, our sleep disorder center is open for new patients. <laughs> I mean, uh, if you talk about a hidden curriculum, that's not so hidden. That went to every screensaver in the UMass system. And I, I mean, UMass is not unique. I mean, there are good things that happen, but in our own institutions, this kind of paradox that we have between the mission statements and the disease mongering that goes on and the lack of ability to connect real care with real need is disingenuous and poisonous. Um, Peabody knew that. He knew that then. So I, I'm going to tell two or three anecdotes, if it's OK, because I don't tell enough of them. I don't know. Because, just because. So because this, this inspired me. So here's my anecdotes. These are Boston medical anecdotes. So Ruth reminded me that the most time you spend with patients is often in prenatal care or if they need frequent paracentesis. And I found this to be the case, right? Those are the two times that I, you get to know someone the best. And so we had a patient from East Boston. He's the only person I've taken care of who doesn't have a belly button. Uh, and it, when you're doing a paracentesis for something, that's sort of a striking thing to find. Uh, some of you may remember this gentleman. So um, when I was sitting with him with six or eight leaders coming out, I asked him, you know, what gives? Like, How'd that happen? Like, we're not, you're not Adam, so we made, you know. But, and he was a good guy. To, we were hanging out. We got annoyed. It was like the third time I'd done this with him. I just never thought to ask. He said, well, you know, I was in Texas once, and I just had no health care, and, you know, my ascites got to be so much that it eventually just ruptured, and they had to perform plastic surgery for me, and now I don't have a belly button anymore. And I thought, wow, 
you know, I didn't know that. That's, that's, some, that's not lavish attention I was giving him, but boy, that was an attention he deserved. And then I, I did say to him, you know, why is it that you're coming back so often? I mean, it's, this is every week we're doing this for you, and it just must be a hassle. He said, well, the real problem is I live in East Boston, um, and Lana Habash and her van help me out out there. Um, but when I need to come into town, which is pretty often on the T, I can't take my diuretics because I pee all over myself in the T. And so I choose not to take them, and then this is sort of what happens. And, it, and you realize, you know, that doesn't fall into a chart, like an ICD-9 code, like doesn't want to take diuretics because of it, right? So uh, these stories are very meaningful, and uh, the, the last three are very quick. One is, this is the use of automobiles. I'm going to share that one in a second. So, uh, you know, people's lives, he's, this gentleman has since died, but it gives you a flavor of what people are dealing with in their lives, and I don't know if folks have had a chance to put their hands on this book, but... This gets at the soul of this stuff. So this is from Laguna, um, the hospital, the former hospital for the poor in San Francisco, Laguna, Laguna Honda. And this, she, this writer, Victoria Sweet, is, she's got it. I mean, so here's one of her stories. Uh, I've only about halfway through, but so here's a patient. They keep people like we did. Like, remember we had people with you know, TB, retinitis, and they're in for like six weeks getting their penicillin. You're like, I can't believe, you know, there must be a better way, but there wasn't then. There was not a better way then. So here's a gentleman who's still there uh, uh, order, waiting for his special shoes, but waiting for Medicaid to approve them, right? Is that ever, that's never happened to me. So I, I, this is, it must only happen in San Francisco or something. So uh, Dr. Curtis, the, his doctor, asks uh, three months, and then he said, uh, you know, what size shoe do you wear? A size nine. So thought about what he did and charts and quality assurance forms. And he left the hospital, he got in his car, drove to Walmart, and he bought nine running shoes for $16.99 and put them on the patient and wrote the discharge orders. Was he planning to submit a receipt for his reimbursement? I laugh, right? I mean, how many times like, the system gets us caught up in ways that we don't see the solution so clearly? Um, and when we do see the solution, the system doesn't like that. So here are three times. One time in South Boston, I'd met a patient. She'd just been raped, and uh, she needed a sane evaluation uh, in the ER, and so um, I drove her there, right? So that's what you would do to see, so you do for someone you cared about. Um, the next patient I did something similar for that too was suicidal in, in the Quabbin, and uh, she was agoraphobic. She hated being around people. She thought an ambulance would really make her much worse. So I drove her to the hospital, and then I got in trouble with my medical director because an accident could have happened. Like, that's really, <laughs> that's very thoughtful. And the most recent uh, car drive was with a 27-year-old gentleman with a heroin addiction who had flatlined last year. When he overdosed, he lives three and a half miles from our health center, doesn't have a car, uh, and was just trying to get started with buprenorphine. So drove, picked him up, dropped him off, got a script, drove him back home. Like, these things are not that hard. Like, when you actually think about them, like, that gentleman almost died, and now he's probably not going to die. Like, because someone got in a car. I mean, this stuff is, so uh, these things are doable. They are not what we hear in the headlines, right? Doctor gets in car, helps patient. No, we've got the Da Vinci robot on the front page, right? And I'm not, so, so the, but it's the caring, this part matters. This part really matters. In fact, it's probably the only thing that matters. And so we're used to this, right? And in fact, Ruth and I and our kids got to go in the set for ER at Warner Brothers. It was pretty cool, like the water tower thing and all that stuff. But, uh, but I'm willing to share with you a very special slide I put together just for you, right? Because one of my professors in medical school said there's never going to be a TV show called Chronic Care. <laughs> and I said, Tom Moretz, you're probably right. But in my lifetime, I'm going to put that, I'm gonna put that show together, all right? But there have been shows, it's interesting how the public does like sort of the safety net perspective. They like a saint elsewhere. They like an ER. They don't like going home with the patients. That's the problem though, right? They like our world. They don't like the other world so much. That's the part I want to, we should twist a bit. So I've created this new slide for you all. Are you ready? I'm taking away that. Look at that. That took me an hour, I think. It's pretty good though, huh? I had to write fonts. It's very complicated. Okay, but 
<laughs> right? You want to have that slide, though. I know you want that slide I once do. you see that. See? You want that yeah. slide. Yeah. Okay? I'm not even charging. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> All right. Would you guys be okay if I just sort of whipped through the other slides for a while? Okay. So I'm going to whip through them, and then we're going to slow down again and talk. Is that all right? But I, okay, because Ruth is about to so like, Steve, get through these. Okay. <laughs> all right. So major issues here. One is we've never done this before in the human existence, right? We've never had a situation where non-communicable diseases are the primary form of the way people die and live. So Boston City was not built. Boston City was built for cholera, cholera, TB. That's why the balconies are there. Like, it wasn't yeah. built. What's that? Yeah. Diphtheria. I know they're not because of the whole thing. I know. But we remember them. I remember that. I was there. But this is different. Like, this is, this is multi-morbidity. And the first person to live to 150 is alive today. Like, that should capture our attention. <laughs> like, this is a different way of thinking about things. And, and I love this BMJ graphic. Like, if you have AFib, like, you're likely to have these other things, too. Oh, we don't have a guideline for that, though. Oh, what do we do now? <laughs> we don't have a guideline for AFib plus depression plus a painful condition plus dementia. I mean. I mean, the, the kind of sort of very simplistic way we thought about people's medical issues is embarrassing. Um, and then we've made an embarrassment of this. And I say we very globally because I don't feel like I'm that responsible for this. But man, this industry has gone whack. $2.8 trillion a year? Are you kidding me? That's my signature line here. So I, told, I stole it from Ruth. Look at this. We spend this much, right? And look at that breakdown, crappy, I think. Um, what happens? This is where, this is going to bankrupt, I mean, this is bankrupting us right now, right? And it's not even good. It's not even good for most people. Like, what is that? Like, bankrupting you, but not good? Like, that's a bad combination. It has costs. I, this slide, as a resident of Massachusetts for quite a while now, is especially striking because I work in this field, and since 2006, I've been grateful for the fact that we have universal coverage. But it comes at a cost, baby. Look at that. Everything else flat. Flat for 10 years. Flat or down. And this isn't small stuff like, I don't know, these yellow lines didn't get painted. I mean, this is higher ed, local aid, public health, right? Did you see that Boston Globe article? Lauren Smith going hat in hand to legislatures to try to beg for 1.4 million bucks so they can actually do public health. Wait, we burned through that money in a day on one floor in a medical center. So, I mean, this is a ridiculous turnaround between what has to happen which should happen, and what happens in the United States. So we love to spend money in healthcare. We are not so good about sort of social service. And you know what? That's a problem because we keep banging our heads against the wall. Why do we have these problems with healthcare outcomes? Oh, I don't know. Why is USA all by itself over here? Oh, I don't know. Well, when you have this distribution between medical care and the lack of social services for people, you get this problem. If you want to actually fix the problem, you actually have to take care of people in ways that we don't want to monetize. So here you have people trying to get their food stamps, and then a headline from two days ago. <laughs> I, I mean, two days ago. So um, you know, a study came out of Chicago, right? how many specialists, the delay in care for children with Medicaid to get to a specialist. Like, this is not trivial. Like, this is about people's real lives with the way that we finance care for people. Um, and ultimately, this is not, this is the problem, right? You cannot do health care because you think you're going to make a margin. Um, we have to be honest about that. We keep banging our heads against this, like, you know, and people are very excited. I've got this new robot thing. It's so cool, it's gonna help people. Oh shoot, it didn't help people, but lots of hospitals still love it and advertise with it. Hmm, now what? I mean, we just, we've gotta stop being surprised by that. I, I'm speaking for myself. I'm no longer surprised. I expect these things to happen, and now it's a matter of getting at the roots of them because they are gonna to continue to happen. So here's, this is, this is the Wall Street Journal this week, going back to John's recent blog. Doc Owens Hospital is prepped to fight. These guys have a 25% profit margin. All surgery, all day surgery, all the time. I just want to show you their waiting room in Fort Worth. They're building a new hospital outside of Dallas. And this is a waste of money. It's not a right waste of money. It's, it's criminal what they're doing. Our youngest daughter has a plan. She's going to steal from mean rich people and give to poor people. 
and we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna take care of her in prison. But <laughs> <laughs> but you know you can sort of see how this thing happens, right? This is not like it's happening before our eyes. Like this is look at the, look this is this is medicine when it's portrayed to us. Um, and just this this is the one line that we all I'm gonna get a tattoo of this a temporary tattoo. We Reinhardt patients play a dual role, both object of human compassion and biologic structures that yield cash flows. Biologic structures that yield cash flows. That is real. That is how a lot of people see people. That is true. And you, your great point about just speaking up, it's, it's speak up time. You guys have been doing it for a long time, okay? And so you know how to do it. Right? This is, an old, this is an old problem. This is a very, very old problem. And as Atul Gawande notes, this is, healthcare is a wicked problem. It isn't a tame public policy problem. It isn't sort of like, oh, uh, we'll put recycling bins out and people will recycle, you know? Like there are always trade-offs and we're very poor as a society at sort of meeting those trade-offs. So this is my mm -hmm. current, one of my current modalities. <laughs> uh, I love this shirt. I don't, I, I, this is on, on the street. I actually had to stop and take a picture. Okay, I don't know her at all, Ruth. I don't, I don't know her at all, okay, <laughs> okay. Now, I'm gonna, this is the next quick part of the talk. This is where the academy is failing us. And we are, many of us, in the academy, and we love the academy. Like, I am like, I love the, I love, like, I love the smell of the library. Like, Ruth is, knows, like, I'm a little bit weird. But we love the academy. The academy is not doing so well, as our earlier keynote mentioned. Like, uh-oh, we don't know if half our treatments work. That's sort of problematic. Uh-oh, like, why is, I love JAMA, I love Howard. You're doing a great job, Howard. But, why is this article in JAMA? Effective acetazolamide and auto CPAP on patients who travel to altitude? Like, there's only a certain amount of print in JAMA? Like, this affects like three people a year. I mean, we, have, we can't put a public face on things like this when there's so much more important work to be done. And I truly believe JAMA's done a much better job. This is one that's, I'm not, it could be any journal, but it hasn't been. And then this one, like, this is nature genomics. Like, I love genomics. Kim, you know, I love this stuff. I love biomarkers. Look at all this. If we just did this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and this, someone would get better. <laughs> right, I mean, this is what we read. People love this crap. <coughs> Here's my new slide. If we do this, people get better. Like, are you kidding me? I mean, come on, people. Ah, oh, can't take anymore. Okay. <laughs> then we have this fetishism about innovation. If I hear the word innovation one more time, I'm going to lose it. Like, someone has to always qualify that with effective innovation. Like, if I bleed you, that is an innovation. Like, that's, wow, we haven't done that in a while. It's sort of new. Like, and if you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, innovation just says new. Like, new is not great. New kind of really stink, right? New can kill people and cost a lot of money. So Paul Glasier's got it right. He says, we. Forget about it. These are, we have to do effective innovations. High yield on investment innovations. We don't have time for this stuff anymore. This is the stuff that kills me. You've got to watch this video. It is the funniest thing ever. So surrogate outcomes, there's our Achilles heel, one of the major ones in academic centers. I'm so sick of them. And the FDA just approved another diabetes medicine based on A1C. I can't take it. Joshua, help us. OK, look, they all went in the right direction. The outcome should have been inevitable. No, it's not. The last 14 trials looking at surrogate outcomes for diabetes have not shown any improvement in morbidity or mortality or harm. Why? You know, for Zetia, is it still the second most leading cause, like $1.4 billion a year drug? It's amismide. It does nothing. It lowers people's LDL. It has no effect on their health. We love this stuff. That's, we get so mixed up between efficacy and effectiveness, it's a joke. And we have to resist this. I mean, this is where the DNA stuff is really a problem because it goes way back, right, into BU, like, or wherever, into medical school, like, oh my gosh, LDL up, what is their LDL? Now I have to know, is it 30% different? What's my target? There's never been a trial that looks at targets. There's never been a trial. There was an editorial in circulation last year, cholesterol people, please stop using targets. Use fixed dose, like they use in Europe, which is actually based on data. So this stuff is a mess. This is Peter Provenos' slide, like, technology, we're so bad with technology, like, oh, we must have more technology. 
And so what you get is an ICU that goes from this to this, right? And from Peter's perspective, this ain't so good. But that's Hopkins now. That's their new ICU. It looks flashy. You know, would you want to put that in the front page of the paper, even though people survive more? And then this one, just I just never understood this. So here's BU. Here's the medical school. Here's the School of Public Health. Like, how much interaction did I have in residency with these people? Like, who are those weird people there? Like, I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Something with health? Not important. <laughs> Way through, I've done, I have another map. Harvard looks the same. Tufts, they're like within, you can throw a rock. No one ever throws a rock. They don't even know they're there. OK, why is this important? Because that's all that matters. All that really matters, except for this 10% that healthcare affects, is public health or genetic genes. So the gene part, I don't, we're not quite there yet. But this other part, we can do stuff that helps people. And you know what? It has a hell of a lot more impact than what the medical system is set up to do. Here's This is in Minneapolis. Three miles affects people by 13 years, right? Right? 13 years. You know, in Britain right now, they spend enough money on diabetes medications, they could fund 40,000 personal trainers. <laughs> the BMJ this happens, right? 40,000 personal trainers in Britain. God bless them, right? And they spend almost nothing compared with what we spend, right? Show me one, one trial outside of metformin that improves outcomes for people because they're on an anti-hyperglycemic. <laughs> not microvascular, not macrovascular, doesn't happen. So this part is tiny. Even though we love it, this is what we do every day, and boy, it's crucial. But it's often crucial because we tie into this other stuff because that's what we get, right? Even though the culture doesn't. OK, I'm moving quickly. OK. All right. We get that someone doesn't have HIV. They've got other stuff on their mind, things that are affecting them. And Ruth introduced me to Victor Montori's, Montani's work from Mayo, and he now has an editorial now in JAMA. Again, you're talking with a patient. And that patient's not just thinking about my A1C, but whoa, there's a lot of stuff going on in my life. And so now we have anxiety. Oh, here's your tablet. Oh, you just can't eat? Well, I'm sorry. Why don't you take a tablet? I mean, this is, again, such a twisted medical system. I'm gonna, I'm, there's a hopeful part to this talk. In fact, most of the talk is hopeful. OK, OK. This is admiring the problems. I have solutions. I'm coming, Sandy. I'm done. I really am, OK? OK. All right. People get their lives back. People can get their lives back if they can get help. But I love the work CASA does down at Columbia Way, right? Like, you can't get help for addiction in the United States. What is that? If you have addiction, except for tobacco, got about a 10% chance your doctor's going to be able to help you. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really great. 2.8 trillion bucks, and I get a 1 in 10 chance. So what do we end up with? We get up a lot of people going into my kind of world, corrections. And this is deinstitutionalization for mental health. These are people with mental health. You know, this is not rocket. Like, this is somewhat predictable. And this is the one that we learned when we were training, and we know it now, but we have to keep say it loud, say it proud. This is almost a law, mm -hmm. that the more the availability of good medical care varies inversely with the need for it. How bizarre is that, and yet how truthful and how important for us to grasp, unpack, work with it? Because this is not, we should not be continually surprised. This was developed in 1971 in Lancet. I'm sure Jesus knew about this, right? This stuff goes way back, okay? I'm just in Jesus, the, you know, the idea of Jesus. Okay, so what do we have? We have two doctors in one Bronx zip code, right? We've got, Walmart's not stupid about this. Like, they see where this is going. Primary care at Walmart. Oh, you want birth, I'm sorry, no birth, oh, we don't do that here. I don't, uh, Walgreens right now, as of today, is doing chronic illness. So this stuff is happening, things are changing. Maybe some of this is good. Like, we are, immunization rates sort of stink. Maybe it's better if someone's at Walmart they can get their vaccine. I think that's not a bad idea. But there's something about this where we, as a field, haven't really generated a voice. I'm saying we outside of CIR, all the good work, NPA, all the AMSA, all these entities that have been carrying the torch. Uh, and this, this, this thing is breaking down now. Like, this is our old, this is old school. Like, people sort of get sick, and some go to a hospital, and some don't. Like, this is much more fluid now. Like, I manage, I think, half my patients by phone or by email. Like, it's really coming undone. Uh, and then this is, a, this is an example of Kodak. Like Kodak went bankrupt because they thought film was cool. But film is not so cool. And now you have like this problem. <laughs> like 
nostalgia for what medicine used to be like, it's not going to be like that anymore. It's not going to be like that. But you know what? Most of our people don't know that. OK, now, the hopeful part. Hope. <laughs> hope, right? You know, hope was the, at the very bottom of Pandora's box. It's the last entity, the last deity that's in, trying to get out. So we're going to let hope out, OK? Because there is a lot of hope. So this is, this is Thomas Edison. You know, vision without execution is hallucination. <laughs> Vision without execution is hallucination. I'm sick of vision. I'm sick of admiring. I'm tired of it. It's time to get done. OK. We've got to change the wheel. But you know what? The Stone Age, as Brian Jack reminded me of this quotation, did not end for lack of stone. There's still a lot of stones around. We don't use stones for tools anymore. So what is going to change our culture so that we do change? And I think this signal part from Camden Coalition points that in direction. We have breathtaking opportunities disguised as unsolvable problems. So let's look at some of these breathtaking opportunities, and I'm almost done. One is that everything is changing. Like, this isn't me saying this. This is like Clayton Christensen, like some smart guy. He's a very smart business school guy, right? Like, this is just getting started. Like, we're doing hospital at home, health affairs, 70% decrease in costs, better outcomes, ICU at home. Like, this stuff is happening. It's going to keep happening. If we put our shoulder to it, it can happen even better. So what, what can we do to help out with that? One is we need to just recognize that it's not going to generally happen in the hospital. So most of our training is really hospital-centered, has been for centuries. And we're at a place now in medicine with that first slide of communicable diseases, we have to really think differently about our training. When you wonder why people are so scared to do outpatient medicine, it's because you know what? They're not really getting trained in outpatient medicine. <laughs> we have to be honest about that. Outpatient medicine can be scary. Inpatient medicine can be scary. But if you're not exposed to it, you're going to be really in a, in a lurch. So what do we have? We have people starting to recognize at a pretty you know, influential level that the impact is going to happen on social determinants. And here's Charlie Baker of Harvard Pilgrim, right? If the system's been starved. right? And I say this, one of the things I loved about BMC the most is that everyone there my colleagues got it. Our trauma surgeons got it. Our GI folks got it, right? Our derm people got it. I people got it. ER people got it. Everybody got it. They got what the important stuff was. And in the world outside of safety nets, it seems like that's a little bit different now, right? Sometimes someone will get it, and sometimes they're not going to get it so much. So I'm talking about cross specialty work, because I'm with a uh, direction toward Kami Graham in a second, OK? So here's a lady who gets, gets her usual workup, mega workup, and it turns out um, she had a bad home situation. And now she's OK. Right? I mean, the, these entities like Health Leads are starting with Lord Gottlieb and other folks on the West Coast are starting to sh really try to create communications that gets us across to people. And look, baby, this was the Institute of Medicine two days ago. right? The IOM, I mean, they've done amazing work with Harvey Feinberg. Like, they're ready to rock. Like, they're like, we're doing a crappy job. And we can do it better in these very particular ways. They are a really important partner for us. Uh, so here are my examples. What I love about Project Assert, do you remember Project Assert? I was like, Project Assert is the best thing in my life. Like a 24-7 access to John. John is going to come talk with my patient in the ER and help them get sober, help them get clean. Like, boy, is that a good idea. I mean, I just love, I can't, it still gives me goosebumps. That, those conversations were amazing with people. Like just sitting with someone understanding why they were there, working to help improve the situation. That is a model. I did especially for this is Look at, I mean, the food pantry. 7,000 people a month. That place serves 7,000 people a month at BMC. That didn't happen because someone thought they couldn't you know, get in a car and drive somebody somewhere, right? It happened because people couldn't eat. And they recognized that was important for health. Is that funded very well? No. We like to give money toward robots. But that's why we're going to break the system down. OK. You bring a van to people, people will need to go to the ER less. Well, that, wow. wow. <laughs> you know, for the cost of one admission, we could buy a van for crying out loud. Like, I just, the, the way that we put money and allocate money is so bizarre. Uh, it only makes sense if you're, uh, I'll, I'll get there later. OK. So, 
this is from David Roll up in Cambridge Health Alliance, right, in Revere, where they have every year, they have an annual reading of the people who have died from overdose in Revere. Look what happens when they get treated. They get more employment, better housing, fewer legal problems. Well, that would be pretty nice. That'd be, wouldn't it be nice if we could do that? Oh, oh, we can do that. Oh, sorry, okay. And we can avoid these situations where people get sort of trapped in sort of the system. We know what the system looks like when you go in with chest pain, but you just sort of bump your, your chest, and now you're gonna get a troponin, and now the admission's gonna happen. Like, you can just see the whole thing playing out, right? And this is like a recent study of why people go to the ERs. I mean, these are millions and millions of visits. Why is it that not every primary care practice has an x-ray machine? I mean, that's what we had to do in Barrie. We're in the rural. We're 21 miles from another hospital. I read x-rays all the time. Bring it on, baby. And if I'm concerned about it, you know, it's digital, so I call radiology. We have these IV bags that dispense IV medication without electronics, right? So 167 cc's an hour automatically. That's what happens. So this past week, we had a lady come in with this. And you can see she's been in the hospital a lot in the past, a lot for these burns that she had. And we got her IV vancomycin. She never went to the hospital. She is so happy. She's not only happy because she went better, she's happy because she didn't go to the hospital. And I love the hospital. Like I stayed on at BMC to do hospitalist work. But, but if people don't have to go, they shouldn't go. <laughs> right? There's stuff there. <laughs> and it's a cost. There's a cost to going there. People's lives get disrupted. So this lady is over the moon. Right? Because that little plastic bag. So what do we have to do? We had to learn how to do midlines. It's not hard. I can put in a 29-day 20 day midline. No pick, no need for ultrasound. Done. 29 days. This is doable now. This is 2013. Like, people can do stuff. And look how happy people get. Like, our nurse <laughs> loves taking care of her, right? Because she knows how important it is. She's not getting paid 10 extra bucks because she stayed after an hour to help her. She wants to do this. Resist the pay for performance stuff unless you're really sure about it because a lot of it stinks. You know, this is, who took the mouth out of the body? Like, seriously, like, <laughs> whose idea was that? Like, people have trouble with their teeth. We do such a bad job with it. So I think as CIR supporting entities like dental therapists that can do 75% of the work of a dentist, we've got to put our shoulder to that. We've got to, uh, the ADA is not so happy about it, but you know what? Mass Medical wasn't so happy about it when we did nurse practitioners. Okay, so we're not like calling the kettle black or anything like that, right? I mean, this is a problem. And we have no solutions for this. This takes folks out of high school, two years of training, 75% of the work of a dentist. It takes effort to keep people healthy and out of the hospital. And I just want to give so many props to Cambridge Health Alliance, right? Here's a program for asthma that ended up shuttering their pediatric ward because it worked so well. Like, why is that not front page news every day? Hospital puts its pediatric ward out of business because so effective at community health. Right, that is a headline. And you know, Hopkins now visiting with people online. So I just want to say that's interesting. This is sort of a Hopkins-ish kind of thing. It was like 11 people. They're like, it's like all over the news. I'm going to tell you something, a secret. So we have over 100 patients with hepatitis C. This is our registry from Barry. Over 100 patients in the rural, right? Who helps us with that? I'm not going to shine a laser in your eye, Cammie. This person right here, Cammie does. Cammie does, look. Look, Cammie is right there, right? Who doesn't like that? That is a Boston connection right there. But I'm in the rural, Cammie is not. Cammie knows what she's doing, I do not, right? I work at UMass, she works at a different academic medical center. We actually created a relationship like, that was too hard to create than it should have been, right? That is helping scores of people who know now that they can wait for treatment and be safe and have a better outcome and have been scared out of their minds. Here's the Outer Cape, here's Lawrence. You know, this is doable. This is this. This is happening now. Now. And because we're a cross-specialty organization, we should be promoting this. We should be putting our backs into this. Started in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Let's get our New Mexico people showing us the way. I mean, this is, this is baseline stuff. And you know what? You're going to start to dismantle the whole system. Because once you start doing this, you know how many people and people have to go to the clinic for hep C? Handful, right? You know what, right now, UMass Hepatitis Clinic has a wait list. A wait list. And they didn't want to join with us because they're too overwhelmed. I'm like, 
I'm just, look, I, I'm leading you to water. Like, this is the solution to your wait list, is to ca create capacity for us in primary care. So this is just old school stuff, and I, this, just is, this gets in it. This is Aver Goldman stuff. This is bringing us into the home. This is where the stuff happens. Like, the more we get in there, in the world, this is, if this was a pill, you'd do anything to get it. You'd do anything for this. The number needed to treat for this is like one, okay? <laughs> All right, the number needed to treat for mild hypertension with pharmacotherapy is infinite. Cochrane Review this past year. So we don't know what we're really doing when it comes to the markers we're looking at. This is the marker. The marker is people's health, getting in the car, driving to their home, figuring out what's going on, sitting around a table, checking stuff out. I mean, the folks that have done this, like you've maybe read about in Hot Spotting article, Jeffrey Brenner at Camden, right? I'm like, I mean, just. Please, I just, I, like, there should be a statue of Jeffrey, like, down here. Like, there should be a statue of him. And his people he takes care of, right there, like, next to the ducklings. Like, that is how important this is. Like, how many, I remember being at BMC, right? Like, this is not so unusual, right? Like, okay, good luck out there, right? Have fun storming the castle, right? I mean, it's a, it's a disaster. Like, so what do they do? They met with this guy. Here's this lady here from AmeriCorps. They get in his home. They're working with him. They're on the ground. This is not foreign to us. This is Francis Weld Peabody stuff, okay? We have long-term roots in this. And then we can start to coordinate. Because this thing is a disaster for the patient. And so this guy went from almost $300,000 a year, 15,000, right? Now, why is this not exploding around the country? I think I'm not, I'm not cynical, but I am a healthy skeptic. Nobody's making money. Nobody's making money. Nobody's making money. You know, people have jobs that depend on this right there, right? <clears throat> We've got to think about that. Because we have to dismantle this system in a way that, that's careful, safe, intentional, deliberate, relentless. But we are going to have to dismantle it and rebuild a new system. I mean, when you've got Ezekiel Emanuel talking about community health workers and JAMA internal medicine, like something's happened. Something is a little bit different. When we start to recognize that we don't have a lot of control over what happens to people most of the time, like that is a different thing. There's our folks up in Nuka in Alaska, right? Like they get this stuff. And then you have Brian Jack and Barry Zuckerman, right, from the home turf, writing articles in JAMA on social determinants. And my last two slides are coming up, I promise. But look, health services innovation, the time is now. Let's think a little bit differently, like, who's this guy? Two, two, two. Interesting guy, right? Nobel Prize winner, Muhammad Yunus, right? Starts the Grameen Bank with micro-lending. Well, you know what? If I had a patient, if he could get his truck fixed, he could get back to his landscaping job. He just needs 500 bucks. I had a lady get out from a 10-day overdose visit to Bay State, where she was in the ICU. She got out, her car was impounded because she pulled over the side of the road. She had a $750 bill. She has no money, her purse is in the car, she has no job. Now what? She's accruing 50 bucks a day now. Well, I don't know, she just spent, we just spent $150,000 on our admission, but now she can't get her car? Like, this is such a stupid system that we have to recognize it's stupid. In fact, we're not, we could recognize it, but other people have recognized it before us. Watch this. Are you ready? This took a long time. Muhammad Yunus was on The Simpsons! Like, <laughs> Lisa loves Muhammad Yunus on The Simpsons, right? This is doable. If The Simpsons can see this, now you have organizations trying to get people cars deliberately by improving their credit. Like, these are things that could happen in our clinics. This should happen. We should be loaning money to people so they can get their lives back. And we have some support here. If you look at the actual legislation for the Massachusetts health care law, these are in the law. This is what accountable care organizations should be doing. This is in law. We have the wind at our back now in a way that we haven't had I, in my long life, right? We haven't had the wind at our back like this. So in closing, Ruth is glad to hear this last part. Guess who said this? We need a new architecture, more Frank Gehry, less formal Greek. Might seem haphazard, but intentional and sophisticated. We used to have a few strong columns, you know, a few uh, shoulders of the giants, right? But we need some, a different mix now. So let's look at this in the last bit. We're used to this. 
this is very, this is like the golden mean, the rule of thirds. Like this stuff is, we, this is, goes way back, very limbic. It's got this floor plan. Like this is very geometric. I'm all for it, right? But this is actually how Frank Gehry thought about the Guggenheim, right? Very different. But this is accurate. This is what people's lives are like. People's lives are not like that. They look like this. We have to be in there with them in a very sophisticated, thoughtful, comprehensive, smart set of architecture. And safety net is the way to go. So my last slide here is coming up. This is right here. Thank you very much for your time.